Great. Hey, Daksh. Thank you so much again. Fantastic product. I was testing it before this call and I connected to my GitHub, was playing around with one of my repositories, which I wanted to build, but I was super lazy to understand what I wrote. And I was asking, just like I'm chatting with the ChatGPT instance, giving me very good results and more motivation to write code again. So fantastic product. Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate it. Really appreciate you taking the time. I wanted to know feature rundown of what Graptil can do, use cases, and we can start from there and I can ask some probing questions in between. Definitely. Yeah, I can do that. So we have, uh, let me share my screen here. Sure. Graptile is a tool that lets developers search and understand large code bases in plain English. The way to think about it intuitively is it is an AI expert on your code. So any question that you would ask, for example, a senior developer on your team or someone that's been around longer or the, or the original author of the code, what would you ask them? And any question that you ask them, Graptile should be able to answer too find code references, explain how things work, et cetera. And it is inherently conversational. So it's very much like talking to an expert. Um, now, let's say I'm a developer uh, at a company called Tabnam. And my task is that we have an application called Onboard Me, and my job is to add sign-in with Google as one of the sign-in options. And let's say that this is a code base that I'm otherwise familiar with, but I haven't played around with the authentication parts in the past. And so this is an area that I'm new, that I'm new to the authentication flow. So I'll start by asking an overarching question. I'm going to ask, how does auth work in this code base? And Graptile maintains a up-to-date knowledge graph of how all the different parts of the code base interact. So it's able to find the right parts of the code base and then use that to explain how everything works. So it looks like there's an options.ts file. I can click on any of these and they'll pull it up in my GitHub viewer or whatever code hosting platform I use. And it walks me through it. It says, looks like there's a provider setup that's happening in options.ts as it's labeled right here. Um, it looks like there's some uh, session management that happens with this route.ts file. There's some authentication logic. It explains that token management is in this token provider route.ts, and it summarizes this. And again, this is all just taken from the code. When you submit a code, uh, code base, it can generate this documentation and stores it. Um, now, I have all the underlying information, and I'm seeing that it actually says that we use next auth. That's what's implied here, using next auth for our documentation. So it says mentioned here as well, we use next auth. And I haven't used next auth as a developer. Uh, and I don't want to go through the docs myself. Uh, you know, next auth is very complicated docs. And so what I'll do instead is I'm going to add next auth's repo to this context. So Greptile can read the docs for me and give me up to date and accurate help on how to integrate next auth. So I can go ahead and add this. And now, Greptile has access not only to my repo, but also to Next. And so now I can ask a question like, how can I use Next Auth to add sign in with Google to onboard me? Give detailed steps. I want a ton of handholding here. I want it to walk me through how this process works. So now it's taking a look at both the Next Docs as well as my repo. And now it pulls up these relevant files, the auth tutorial looks like the route.ts. Starts by telling me some basic things like installing next auth, like installing the, the Google next auth provider, configuring OAuth in the Google Cloud Console. It also community puts a link here so I can I can take a look at that and do that myself. Um, it give, it says I have to go to options.ts in my code base and add this code snippet in the auth options. That makes sense. I'm adding a Google provider as one of the options in the in the auth um, in the auth function. And uh, gives me a note about updating the client ID, tells me update, how to update the environment variables that are in my uh, .env.local file right here. Um, and it also shows me how I can create a React component and it tells me where to add that as well. So it's kind of quick, it has full code context. It's not only generating code for me, telling me exactly where to put it, uh, you know, exactly how sort of an engineering mentor would do. Tells me how to test it, tells me how to deploy it, and I'll have all the information. Now, a couple of other cool things you can do with Graptile. Graptile is really good at figuring out where a bug is coming from. So we don't have any active bugs in this code base. I can send you a video later about how I, I recently used it to, to resolve a bug. But essentially, you can drop in an error message or a stack trace, and Graptile burrows through the code, finds the source of the bug, and uses that to solve uh, and give you corrected code, figure out what, what's going wrong. It's kind of like how a kind of all-seeing uh, engineer would do if they were given the code base. Another thing that I've recently started using it for is when I write something with Google, for example, I want to be able to now, for example, create a knowledge base article about how to add authentication methods. So I can say, generate a markdown wiki for how a developer 
can add um, uh, uh, auth options to onboard me. Um, and now it should just, just open it up a little bit. It should generate, looking at all these different uh, parts of the code base again, it generates smart done documentation. I can just copy and paste this. And now this, this kind of wiki knowledge article has been created. I can use this as, as I please. That's another common use case. Now, the things we see developers using it for most often. Um, number one, by far, is grokking code bases that they're not necessarily familiar with. This could be open source code bases, could be their own code base, maybe it's parts of the code base they haven't seen before. Two is figuring out how to do things that are multi-file code changes. Three is debugging. Um, and, and between those three, I'd say about 80 or 90% of our use case is, is between those three things. Understanding code base you haven't understood, figuring out how to map out like complicated code changes, debugging. And recently, we're now seeing people use it heavily for generating documentation. So now, this is essentially just a wiki knowledge article. I can paste this into whatever um, you know, provider I use for documentation and just use it that way. Can you give me some background motivation on coming up with this tech? Yeah, uh, so this is kind of um, we, this is a pivot for us. We pivoted back in July from from working on our previous startup. So my co-founders and I graduated from computer, computer science degrees, Georgia Tech. That's where we met, and we all kind of had brief careers working in big tech. So uh, my co-founders, Suhoon, spent some time working at Microsoft in Seattle. Other co-founders spent some time at Amazon and some time at HubSpot. And I was at AWS for a little bit of time. And the number one problem that I faced at AWS was the complexity of their code base. And AWS is one of the most sophisticated. Kind of piece of technology maybe ever created. And the docs are very outdated, which is to be expected of fast growing teams. Generally, the docs are not very up to date. Generally, the code is very complex. And because this was kind of 2022 is when I was working there, um, the the team was fully remote. And so it's kind of hard to get the attention of a senior developer who could maybe help me figure out you know, how to, how to go about my engineering tasks. And that was a pretty difficult aspect of working the job. And we started coming and kind of toying with this idea of like, what if you could have an AI generated documentation? And they figure, well, you could actually just skip documentation altogether. If you could just have a simple tool that answers accurately any question about any code base. And so we started going down this path. I would say it took us about seven months of iterating with customers and users, and you know, the thousands of developers that have used WebTile in the last seven months to get to a point where I'm confident that yes, we actually have made significant headway into solving this problem. And we can reliably answer hard questions about difficult code bases. It's not perfect. Uh, LLMs are probabilistic, and so they're sometimes going to get things wrong. But I'm confident now is at a point where, generally speaking, it's for basically any developer, it's going to create very meaningful and measurable improvements in productivity. I can totally agree with that. So what's the large language model being used here? Yeah, so we use three models. We use a fine-tuned Mistral, a fine-tuned GPT-3.5, and a fine-tuned GPT-4. And all your fine-tuned data that our free users uh, give us, and uh, we use that to fine-tune the models, use our logs to fine-tune the models, et cetera. And um, uh, we use Mistral mainly for generating doc strings for all the code, so creating the code graph is very fast. And then we have an agent that uses GPT-3.5, and then we use the fine-tuned 4 for a fine inference step. So you said the prompts and responses will be used to train the model. Is, is that the statement you just said? For users that are free users, okay. um, for them, we use their uh, prompts and prompts. We actually don't use their prompts. We use the agent's step in the middle to do the training. But any user that's a pro or business user, uh, we don't, by design, don't use their, their data for anything that resembles training. Okay. Um, when I was connecting my GitHub repository, I saw it's loading the code repository into Reptile, and it's scanning yeah. through it. Is it copying and putting that into Reptile server and doing that analysis? What's what's happening there? Yeah, so temporarily it is. So we, we clone the repo to our ECS container, and then we essentially create an index of it. So that involves creating abstract syntax strings, creating code graphs, understanding relationships, generating doc strings, embedding doc strings. And this process, once it's completed, we delete our copy of your code base. We don't store it on our servers uh, for security reasons. In the future, every time that new code is pushed, we get just the diff from GitHub and do that to update our model. Uh, and, uh, and this happens in real time as soon as new code is pushed. Otherwise, we don't. And while you're writing code, um, sorry, when you're um, when when we need to generate code for your questions for the context, we put it in real time from the GitHub API. Understood. So from the version controlling uh, integration perspective, it can connect only to GitHub today, not other. 
it's GitHub, GitLab, and Azure DevOps right now. Okay. Yeah. That's great. So from the debugging perspective, is there any other UI or the console other than ask question and it will tell you if there is any error you know, to debug a, spe a specific piece or is it embedded within the CI CD pipeline? No, not at the moment, but we do have an API. Okay. And so we let developers at uh, our customers' companies generally build their own integrations that fit their needs perfectly. So we kind of have some kind of platform that lets you build your own internal tools using that tile. Gotcha. So from the, I know it's a SaaS, SaaS solution. Um, I believe it's hosted in AWS, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you have, um, for enterprise, I'm asking this from an enterprise perspective, is it available today in the marketplace so that it can be vendor hosted? Like let's not vendor, customer hosted. I know obviously enterprises have their own cloud presence and they want it to be deployed in their own cloud tenant. Is it is it possible today? Yes, so it's not through the marketplace. We do customer air-gapped VPCs for customers. Uh, we've done this before for especially for large financial organizations. So we have a hedge fund in New York City that uses it this way. There's a mortgage financing company in LA that uses it this way. There are large uh, corporations that have very strict data security rules. We generally will do a full on-prem deployment. So essentially, we'll spin up a uh, all of our provision services. We'll provision them all in customer AWS instead of a, uh, an air gap VPC. The only caveat there is we generally recommend, because our a GPT is a much more powerful model than any other, that you have ChatGPT Enterprise or something of that kind that you can connect to your uh, GeoGraphTile instance. That's interesting. So let's just say if I am an enterprise customer of OpenAI, I can have my enterprise subscription linked to Greftile so that Thanks. it's not Greftile's subscription. Yeah, and it's extremely easy to connect. You just have to add your keys. Key, and that's it. Okay. Understood. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool to know. I was looking at the pricing page on Greptile and one specific piece which caught my attention is compliance. You did mention about compliance. Can you talk about what, what exactly you, you meant by compliance there? Yeah, so we are SOC 2 compliant uh, and we, we go through external audits annually. Now, because business use is generally heavier um, and requires SOC 2 compliance, we upcharge for it uh, for $40 a month per developer instead of 20. And um, while the product is identical for the pro and business tiers, uh, if you want access to our soft two paperwork for your own compliance needs, uh, for that we charge the business tier. Um, and the business tier is generally recommended for smaller companies or smaller teams within large companies. Um, if you have teams of if, larger than 30, 40, 50 people, even, even, even teams that small, if you have more than 30, 40 people, then we generally recommend going for enterprise and we'll usually come to a much lower custom price because the $40 a month starts to get really expensive as you get into your hundreds of engineers kind of sizes. Understood. Yeah, maybe uh, this question is not entirely related to Greptile. So based on your experience, is there a specific coding language that it supports supports the best and a specific coding language it does not support? Yeah, so there's three levels here. Okay. So any language that is not public in the sense that there's no public source code for this language and doesn't re resemble a public language, we just don't support. So okay. that's level three. Okay. Um, we haven't come across any languages like this. I think one well, the only exception is there is one software company here in Silicon Valley that has a language they themselves wrote, wow. and it does not resemble any uh, any public language, so we were not able to support them. Then level two is any public language. We support all of those. We support every public language. Any public source code or resembles a language that has public source code, we're able to use that um, uh, perfectly. Then there's the especially well um, supported language, which is level one. There's about 20 languages in that set. For those languages, we're able to understand code graphs, and that has some improvement to the quality responses. And this is any of your popular languages, Python, Ruby, C, um, Java, JavaScript, TypeScript, et cetera. There's about 20 languages. We're adding support for more as we go. And generally speaking, well, for enterprise customers, um, if, you're, if you have more than 30 or 40 engineers on your team, we'll generally proprietary add support for your language, whatever language it is that you use. Understood. So I've tested GitLab's Gen AI capabilities. I think they call it GitLab DO, just to understand what are all the capabilities it offers. Pretty neat. And I did not see this level of detail there though, but do you think 
you're competing with GitLab in, in that space from a Gen AI capability within the version controlling the... So somewhat, I think there's like all good spaces, there's always going to be great competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, generally that's true for any place where there's a lot of opportunity for creating huge impact. There's going to be a lot of very interesting and smart companies trying to do this. Um, we've kept our focus very narrow, and this has been very deliberate. So while a lot of companies are focused on code generation and focused on, on PR reviews, et cetera, we've kept our focus very narrowly on the best context aware Q&A. The only thing we do is we accurately answer hard questions on complex code bases. Is, we don't do anything else. Um, and everything that we do is a consequence of that. So we are able to put all of our attention into just being able to fully understand large code bases. That's the only thing we're, we're, that we do. And we, we see this as the hardest and most impactful problem in this space. I do acknowledge that the more interesting space in some capacity is the code generation space. But there's a lot of really smart people doing code generation, and I don't think we know anything that they don't know about code gen. So GitHub and GitLab are both doing very interesting things with code gen. But you know, it seems like they've got it. Uh, I don't think we need to add to the uh, to the crowd there. But we've been, I mean, a lot of the reason for the inception of Reptile was we were unhappy with how other products were doing this. Because Reptile was an internal tool at first, at our previous startup. We built it because none of the tools that were kind of supposed to be chat GPT on your code base we're able to successfully answer questions with full code awareness. Uh, GitHub Copilot uh, chat wasn't able to do this. None of the other tools in the startup were able to do this. And so this kind of came from places like, surely this can't be that hard. It was. It was a lot harder than we had initially expected. There was very good reason that this is a thing that widely has not been solved. But I think by having a very singular focus on it, we were able to make a lot of headway. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I think you are right on point as to what exactly you're trying to solve. So I'm going to ask one last question, and we can wrap this up. When, I, when an enterprise knocks your door and they want they want to implement Reptile internally, how long does it take from the initial conversation to having it deployed with everything included? So it really depends on the number of, kind of vendor review and security steps. But from the moment that we pass those steps, it shouldn't really take as long as the bureaucracy wants it to take. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, once those tests are passed, and we're in the spot where we're setting developers up, it can honestly be done in a day. Uh, we just need to get everyone's uh, like, like give me a, we just need a list of accounts that the, the enterprise wants to sign up. Um, it takes at most a couple of hours to process whatever 50, 100 code bases that you might have in your company. Uh, and, and then you can just start using it. It's very straightforward from that perspective. Okay. Um, how long can the compliance and vendor review step take? We have seen it take as much as, much as three or four months. We've also seen it wrap up in two or three weeks. And I think it really depends on, on, uh, on I guess, organizational will within the customer. Fantastic. We're especially interested in financial organizations as a customer type. Mm -hmm. We've seen that they generally tend to have very sophisticated and complex code bases, and that makes Reptile all the more useful. So this is definitely an area of interest for us. Do you have any financial customers today? You don't have to name but We have a, a large hedge fund. Uh, I was talking with a mortgage financing company. We just took on a, a, a fintech unicorn, which is kind of like a sort of a finance company. Uh, Insurance and healthcare? Sorry? Insurance and healthcare? This one was fintech. We actually do have a couple of healthcare uh, okay. unicorns as well that we serve. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank yeah. you so much, Dersh. This is fantastic.